With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. We appreciate so much that you have decided to make us a part of your day, regardless of how you're listening to us, whether you're using the traditional signal on 1440, listening to us on the internet, YouTube, Facebook, whatever. We appreciate you being a, uh, we appreciate you joining us and being a part of our program here. And as always on Thursday, even though we actually did take a break last Thursday because, you know, it was our big Independence Day special. But as always on Thursday, we give you the latest from the Alabama Department of Public Health for our coronavirus update. So you can see here, these are the latest stats and you can see on the map that these are the, uh, th that's the percentage of the population that is a per capita rating of each county's adjusted for population. You can see there. Uh, that, of course, the what are still the hot zones, what are still the, the places in the state of Alabama with the highest level of population of confirmed cases are still right around here in the river region. It's true that Atauga County and Elmore County is not in the, the uh, top tier category that they were just a couple weeks ago, but Montgomery County, Lowndes County, uh, they're all still in that real hot zone sort of area. And what is interesting here as well is that, and, and we've gone over this before, but that Montgomery County is actually uh, doing a lot worse than the other major cities in the state of Alabama, the four big cities in Alabama, of course, big being relative to our state. But um, that's something that we've been keeping our eye on. You can see there from this statistic, that Alabama has 48,588 confirmed cases, 467,754 tests have been conducted. Sadly, 1,042 people have died from the COVID-19, and uh, we have 3,039 hospitalizations and also 25,783 presumed recoveries. So breaking down exactly what all that means, one thing that it should be notable to point out is that we've done a lot more testing, have a lot more cases, and what that does is with our death rate and, and the amount of people that we have dying that have contracted the virus, that has gone down substantially. You may recall that two weeks ago when we gave our la last update that that fatality rate had dropped all the way to 2.69, which when you consider that there was a time in this state that the fatality rating that we had was close to six. In fact, I think it actually surpassed six for a brief time uh, when it came to how many people we had with confirmed cases of the disease versus people dying from the disease. And so that's something that the, the fatality rate was really kind of spooky there for a little while, but it has now dropped all the way down to 2.14. So we've dropped about half a percentage point in two weeks. That's a pretty fast drop, especially considering it happened in just two weeks. You may remember there was a bit of a pause in the drop. I mean, it was still a drop. But it was just a little bitty drop three weeks ago. But we've seen a pretty fast drop over the past two weeks. Dropping a half percentage point is really impressive. And that is even more impressive when you consider the law of diminishing returns. You've experienced this if you've ever had, for example, issues with weight loss. Like, the, the first 20 pounds may be real easy to take off, and the 20 pounds after that, really, really difficult. Well, that's because of the law of diminishing returns. A lot of times when you're dealing with something like this, especially in the, the medical sense, when you're trying to get that fatality rate down, the lower you get it, the harder it's going to be. So this jump between 2.69 and 2.14 
Well, that is as significant as dropping, you know, maybe uh, significantly more significant than dropping a whole percentage point in the span of several weeks going from about five to four, which we did a couple months ago. So that's something that is really, really good. And also, if you consider that the CDC, and we talked about this on the program as well, that the CDC came out with news that they believe that the actual number, based on their sampling and antibody testing, that the actual number for that is significantly higher. In fact, about 10 times as many people probably have the virus than they thought had the virus, and that is good news because that means it would drive the fatality rate even lower. In fact, if we're going by that, luckily it's it's exactly 10 times, so we only have to move the decimal point over. So that would mean our actual fatality rate in the state of Alabama is actually 0.214. So almost at a flat 0.2%, which, by the way, would be in keeping with about the national average that, and about where a lot of doctors were predicting it would be at barely over 0.2. Now, that still means that this disease is at least twice as deadly as the flu, because remember that the flu's death rate is 0.01, but this is really, really good news that we've made it drop to this. And, and the great thing is that not only is that not stagnant in the sense that the more people we discover had the virus, the less fatal we know this virus to actually be, we're also making gains on the other end. One of the things that the CDC came out with earlier this week as well is talking about the decrease, the decline in the death rate of people having the disease versus dying from the disease is at least partially due to better treatment. Well, now, better treatment means that in the span of just a couple of months, because this whole thing really started, they believe now, and, and they actually moved this back a little bit earlier this week as well, that they believe this virus has been in the country since early February. Well, if it's been in the country since early February, and we've really only been treating people for this thing, at least in the United States, since mid-March-ish, because that's when we first started seeing people really get hospitalized at large rates, that kind of thing. That means from the time of, you know, roughly mid-March, to early July, we've already had significant improvements in the treatment of this disease. And that's not to say that we're anywhere near where we would like to be or, or got it anywhere as under control as we would like it to be. But think about this. This disease is now roughly, if, if the numbers are to be believed, and, and the, there's good evidence to suggest that these are the correct numbers, that if the evidence is to be believed that this disease, within the span of less than half of a year, is only twice as deadly to Americans as the flu, which we've been battling for now about a century, actually technically a little over a century, that it's only twice as deadly as that. That's actually pretty good news. And it is a testament to how well our, our medical or how well our medical system adapts to new problems. That's not by any means to say that this thing is, is done. We can all pack it in and go home. We don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm just saying that that is a very hopeful message that within the span of less than one year, we've already gotten this thing down to merely double the death rate of a disease that we have been battling for a century. This is actually pretty darn good news. And we'll go ahead and look at the new cases and look at how we're faring there. So you can see here, these are the latest, and these are, oh, whoop, that's actually the wrong one. That's the one we just looked at. There we go. Okay, so new cases here. These are new daily cases. And you can see there that there is a substantial uptick there at the end of this uh, chart, and it's a sustained one. So it's not like we have a spike here or there. I mean, this is a sustained, substantial increase. And, and this is not something that we were unaware of. Like, we knew that just like in Alabama, just like in every other state, that we were going to have these increases when people started moving, getting out and about, that kind of thing. And you'll see that we have, for the past two days, had uh, over 1,500 
new cases in a single day. I mean, that's that's huge. Guys, there's no two ways about it. That is a substantial increase than what we are used to. But uh, when we're going to look, and, and this time, instead of doing a weekly, since we, we haven't done it for two weeks, we'll do a 14-day average. Uh, let's look at how we're doing compared to the last 14 days. So the 14-day average, in other words, four, uh, from now till 14 days in the past, our daily average has been 1,131. So a little over 1,100. The previous 14-day average, 734. That is an increase of 397, so just barely under 400. We've had about 400 new cases per day looking at that over the past two weeks. That's huge. But the main thing to remember is if our daily rates are increasing at that level and our deaths aren't, then that's actually a really good thing. And so this is the problem that a lot of people run into that we've constantly decided that we're going to move the goalposts that originally we were doing shutdowns and we were doing that kind of thing to stop the medical system from being overwhelmed. And now they're saying that we're doing it to stop the spread of the disease and we're going to, to keep people from getting it, which is ridiculous on a number of levels. That was never the intended goal of the shutdowns. And that's something that's virtually impossible to do. I mean, th there's almost there's no way to realistically shut down society for the amount of time that we would have to do that for to be able to keep people from getting this disease in the first place. That's simply not a realistic, tenable goal. But here are the cases that are going up, and as long as our hospitalizations, and especially our death rates, are not climbing in conjunction with this, then we're going to be okay. But, I mean, a two-week increase with about 400 new cases per day, that's a lot. There's no other way to state it. But now let's also ask ourselves the question, uh, because I, I want to do this, we'll, we'll do roughly a month, not quite a month, 28 days. It's the month if it's February. Uh, 28 days, because that's four weeks. So the 28-day average for the previous 28 days is 933. To compare it to the time where we were in shutdown, the last 28 days of the shutdown was 267 new cases, per day. That was our average, which means on average, and I promise I didn't cook the books or make this up. We're, we're having 666. That's the difference. 666, which I know super ominous. That's just how the math turned out. I didn't, I didn't goose it to make it do that. I promise. Uh, it just came out to 666 new cases per day. So, uh, you know, substantially way more new cases per day. Now, in this past month than we did the last month of the shutdown. So it's very clear, and this is something that everybody expected, when you got the shutdown going on, the spread's not going to be as fast. You're not going to have as many people with that. Although, uh, I will say that it, it may be a little bit overstated there, but overall, you can see that, that very clearly when you have people up and moving around. Because, And the reason I say that is, I realistically think that the shutdown ended, especially for Alabama, who got to the game a little late. It, sh it shut down, officially shut down when it ended, uh, probably about two, two and a half weeks before people more or less got back to life as normal. And the, the data suggests that as well, not just the data of the cases and the numbers, but also data from national organizations that trace about how much people move around. And it, it is... It is very clear based on that data that really, because the government follows the people, the people don't follow the government, that what really happened is that people got out and moving around and the government just capitulated about two, two and a half weeks after that. And so it's not even a great rubric, but just based on the actual rubric of when the shutdown happened, there has been a substantial increase in daily cases compared to that. Now, let's look at tests. How are we doing on testing? Well, uh, the 14-day average for this week is 31. The 14-day average for last week is 32. So actually, we're a little bit down on testing. But it's about the same. It's it's not much different. Uh, or sorry, that's... My apologies. Hospitalizations. Uh, hospitalizations down a little bit. 
I don't know why I said testing. Uh, hospitalization's actually down a little bit on that one. So uh, 14 days from today back, so the, the, the 14 day average that we're in now, 31, the 14 day average before that, the two weeks before that, 32. So just a difference in one, but it is going down. That's, that's a good thing that we're having less hospitalizations uh, per day. And then the hospitalizations now versus the shutdown, this is really going to throw you for a loop. Because again, if our cases are going up, but our hospitalizations and deaths are going down, then we're fine. So the, the hospitalizations per day in the previous month, all of which has been since the shutdown ended, 31. The average of the 28 days, the last 28 days in the shutdown, 56. So we've decreased it by nearly half. We have way less hospitalizations than we did then. And uh, when it comes to testing, our testing is up significantly. That really has nothing to do uh, with the spread of the virus itself, obviously, but that's something that we can hang our hat on. So the 14-day average of testing is 7,054. The previous 14-day average, 6,468. So we have increased daily tests by 586 just in the past two weeks. So props to Alabama for really stepping up its game on testing in a short amount of time. The 28-day average was 6,761. The 28-day average during the shutdown was uh, 5,002, which means we've increased testing since the shutdown ended by 1,759 tests per day. So that's a really, really big increase. We're doing much, much better on testing than we were originally. And that's part of the reason that we're finding more of these cases. The tests are more available. I'm not saying it's the only contributing factor. We actually do have more people with coronavirus. That is a fact. Not denying that. But I'm saying the fact that we have increased testing is also a factor that must be considered when wondering why the numbers are as high as they are. Uh, we do actually have more people getting sick. Yeah, that's, that's obviously the case. But the amount of testing we're doing does play a role. And then finally, of course, this is the biggest one, our coronavirus deaths. So the deaths, uh, the 14-day average for the past two weeks where we were having 11.6 Alabamians die from COVID-19, the 14 days before that, 9.3, which means this two weeks we have actually had an increase in the number of deaths by 2.3 people per day. Not good. And this is partially because of the increase in cases. But just because we have had an increase in deaths over the past two weeks, and that does correlate with the increase in cases, does not mean that it is keeping pace. Because when you consider that in the 14-day the average, we've had a 2.3 more people dying per day, and then you look at the two-week averages of the increase in overall cases that we're having nearly 400 new people per day. I mean, that's a tiny, tiny fraction of people that are dying. So, yes, we are having way more cases than we did before. And we are having more deaths, at least over this two-week period. But it's a very, very, very small amount. And the proportions are way off. We're having a much larger increase in cases than we are in deaths. And remember, that's the two week, uh, this two weeks base, uh, this two weeks differentiating from the last two weeks. That entire time period, the entire 28 day period we're talking about, all significantly after the shutdown has ended. And so a lot of people that are calling for this increase that we need to go back into a shutdown, well, the past two weeks isn't a great gauge of that. Both of these two-week periods have had plenty of time after the shutdown has already ended to gauge whether or not uh, it, it's more of a reflection of what's happening right now than what was happening in the shutdown. That's why we're about to do the comparison with the shutdown. So the 28-day average, the past 28 days, uh, everything that we talked about uh, in the previous, that comes to 2.4. Or sorry, 
10.4, not 2.4. 2.4 would be amazing. So we're having 10.4 Alabamians die per day in the past month. The 28 days previous to the shutdown, in other words, during the shutdown, 11.9. So even with the increase that we've had over the past two weeks, which is substantial, we're still having significantly less, 1.5 less Alabamians die per day in the past month than we did the month during the shutdown. So still, if you're comparing it to the shutdown, significantly less hospitalizations, less deaths, yes, an increase in cases, but not an increase in any of the stats that actually matter. Now, this brings me to a second question, and this, of course, relates to Alabama specifically, but also more broadly to the nation. And it's, it's one that a lot of people have been debating about over the past couple of days, which is, are the protests the reason that we had these spikes? And here's the thing. As we've shown, the shutdowns have virtually no effect on this. We've done several, several segments on this where we show the data how every single state, all 50 states in the union, actually reached peak quarantining levels before the government shut down. And then every single one started their mobility, started coming back. They started moving around and doing things before their governments ended the shutdown. So again, the government follows the people. The people don't follow the government and never have on this thing. That's not the way that America operates. And, and that's a good thing that the people are taking the lead, not the government on this. So Alabama's shutdown ended on the 21st. And remember that we were a little bit later because Governor Ivy was dragging her feet a little bit. There are other states that remain shut down and shut down to a larger degree that were blue states. But among the red states, Alabama was one of the later ones. Uh, by the time that we ended our shutdown, Georgia and Florida had already been open for like two weeks at that point. I want to say it was two weeks. If it was not two weeks, it was close to it, maybe 12 days, something like that. But uh, Governor Kemp and DeSantis had already opened. Uh, Governor Abbott had already opened. Most of your red state governors opened significantly before Governor Ivey did. And so remember, that's when the shutdown started. Ours are closer to where the shutdowns ended. So Alabama's shutdowns ended on the 21st. And then the protest started on the 26th, five days after that. So what's interesting is if you're looking at these spikes and when they occurred, they happened almost to the day, two weeks after the protest had started because the George Floyd protest, the very first one, was on May the 26th. Or no, sorry, May the 27th. So uh, May the 27th would have been the first one. And so that's six days after our shutdown had ended, several other shutdowns had ended at that point. And the spike started about two weeks after the protest, not two weeks after the shutdowns. A lot of states had already opened up by that point. The incubation period had already passed. We had not seen, we had seen an increase in, in that for sure, but we hadn't seen the, the increase that we have seen here recently. And speaking of that, it's interesting to note that these spikes largely happen, not entirely, in fact, Alabama had some rural areas that had this issue too. But these spikes happened primarily in urban population areas. So big population, dense cities. And it also happened primarily amongst younger people. The average age of the person getting this virus and testing positive for it went down significantly when these spikes hit. And that would suggest that the protests may have played a part in it. Why? Because where did these protests take place? Primarily in cities. And who was participating in these protests? And riots, but I'm talking about the protests and riots as a whole. Uh, the, the peaceful ones and the non-peaceful ones. Who, was, who were the people participating in these? Not a lot of old people. Some old people, but not many. Vast majority of them under the age of, of at least 40. Mostly under the age of 30, but, but for sure under the age of 40 vast majority of the protesters fit that description. And so looking at all that data, you can see how somebody would say, well, maybe they had something to do with it. Maybe these protests were part of the reason for that. Here's the thing. I chalk that up to mostly a happenstance because these protests by and large happened outside. Now, interestingly enough, the protests that probably are more likely to have contributed to this are the ones that took place at night, not during the day. 
because of course the virus does not survive for very long in broad daylight. It just doesn't happen. Sunlight is the best disinfectant for this virus as well. It kills it in about 90 seconds, and that's the absolute longest it can survive out in the sun. So if that is the case, that means the, the portions of the protest that put people most at risk were the ones that were happening at night, which also means that the ones that put people at the largest risk were also the people rioting. Because not every protest that happened at night resulted in a riot, but pretty much all the ones that did result in a riot happened at night or very close to it and, and went on into the night. And so it's interesting that those happen to be the ones that were the highest risk. But even considering all that, I still chalk this up mostly to a happenstance because the data that we have seen so far suggests that this probably doesn't actually spread during the day. However, the thing is, the blatant leftist media bias, completely real both the leftists, the elected officials, the people that are thought leaders on the left that treated people that were protesting and wanted the government to open up like they were dangerous, people suggesting that they should, if they want to protest, waive their right to any kind of medical care. Uh, I mean, just horrible, nasty things. You could go on the internet and, and in 10 seconds find a super clips of uh, different media personalities talking about how evil this was, how these people hate grandma and all this other stuff. I remember because there was media coverage of some of the events that I actually covered myself. And that was the general idea that was put out there. When you juxtapose that to the way that these protesters were handled, where there were people on the left and in the media praising them, talking about how important it was, saying it was so important that they should just completely ignore all of that. I remember that there were certain states and certain cities that specifically put out guidelines that uh, for the coronavirus saying that, well, it's okay to protest, putting specific exemptions for that in there. Now, here's the thing. I think that they have a right to protest. I've said that a thousand times on this. Even though I may not agree with the message of the protest, doesn't mean... I'm against the protest. I'm against them being able to protest. So that is one distinction I wanted to make. But here's the thing. Gathering in large groups is still going to be significantly riskier than just going about your day. You walking down the street from your office building to, you know, a restaurant nearby, that's going to be significantly less dangerous than walking down a street in a crowd where you're all chanting and yelling things. I mean, that's just common sense. I still don't think that transmission happens in large numbers outside, but you're, you're basically including every single potential risk factor except for the fact that it's outside. You're, you're close together. Everybody's shouting and yelling. Uh, there's, you're, you're in close quarters. If you've seen the video, the aerial shots from the protests in L.A., you know that, I mean, they were packed in there like sardines. And so zero social distancing going on in most of these events. Not all, but most. And again, with all the shouting and the yelling and everything, then that means that you are going to be more susceptible to catching this thing from somebody else. If there's somebody in the crowd, this virus could potentially move around pretty quickly doing that. It wouldn't take but a few hours. But if it happened outside, that's significantly less likely to have occurred. And so here's what I think actually happened. Because the media had such a blatant bias and because the media had for, you know, about two solid months, and that's being, frankly, lowballing it a little bit, telling you how scary the virus was, how it's going to kill us all, and how we need to stay locked up and, and uh, you know, batten down the hatches. And then all of a sudden, when the protests happened, the media was coming out praising the protesters, saying how it was fine to go out, that they're not in danger, despite the fact that a large number of the protesters were actually of the minority status that they were saying were more susceptible to the virus, they still just kind of rid it off. And the media was acting as though the virus really wasn't all that big a deal and you should go out and protest and have your voice be heard. I think what happened then is an awful lot of young people were watching that and going, oh, well, I guess the virus really isn't such a big deal. Or at the very least, they, that's sort of the sentiment that was reflected partially through the media and partially through word of mouth and just human interaction. I understand that's part of it as well. 
And because of that, and they're saying, oh, look, even the people that were super scared about it, even the people that were telling me that we were going to have to shelter in place for 18 months, like the mayor of L.A., who had one of the biggest protests where everybody was out and huddled together in tight spaces. Uh, if they're saying it's fine now, I guess it's fine. See, that's how I think the protests might have actually affected it. That once you had that sentiment out there, that the virus wasn't nearly problematic enough to justify shutting down these protests that there were an awful bunch of young people that had been hiding out in their homes that are looking around going oh well i mean if it's not that big of a problem if it's not nearly as contagious as they say and i'm a young person so i'm at low risk anyway why don't i just go out and start living my life more or less the way that i had beforehand see if the protests did affect it i don't think because the timelines do match up I don't think that the spikes were caused by the protests themselves. I don't think there was a lot of transmission going on at the protest. I think the general sentiment of the left, where they were basically telling everybody that they were going to die and then flipped it like a light switch and saying, yeah, it's perfectly fine to go out. Even giant crowds of people roaming down the streets, they're perfectly fine. We're not worried about them at all. I think that bled through. And there were a lot of young people that are saying, well, they're not real worried about it, so why should I be? To me, that's the more likely explanation of what really happened here. So that, that's one thing. I'm not going to pretend that the protest, just because I may not have liked some of the things that were said at the protest, some of the things that have been bantied about and, and talked about at these protests, just because I don't like the message of the protest doesn't mean I'm going to blame the protest for a pandemic. That's one thing that's different from me and the left. They were all too willing to try to blame events that they didn't like for spikes in the virus. The Trump rally was a, a perfect example, the one that he had in Tulsa. The, the numbers in Tulsa started going up the day after. I'm like, wow, all of a sudden the virus doesn't need two weeks to incubate. All of a sudden the virus can just, uh, the next day, drastically increase the numbers to levels larger than were even in attendance at the Trump rally. And somehow we're supposed to believe that overnight the, the virus just became super virus and was able uh, to grow very, very quickly. Uh, it's just so ridiculous that they, they suggest that the virus is smart enough to know the difference in your political affiliation. But, but that's how it goes. They're perfectly willing to blame an increase in numbers for the virus on some, a political rally or a political gathering that they don't like and they're not willing to do so when it's one that they're sympathetic to. I don't play that game. I don't think that the, I don't think that the protest actually did increase the rates. I, I think they could have played some factor, but I think it was largely just because of the way it was treated rather than the gathering itself. So real quick, I uh, did want to go over this op-ed that was put together by the Alabama Senate Minority Leader, Bobby Singleton, so he wrote this in, uh, I believe it was ABC 3340 News, which is a, a Birmingham station. And this is an opinion piece. It's an op-ed. And so this is the minority leader and his take on this. I left Montgomery on Thursday evening fuming. In four weeks, more than 7,000 K-12 through students, teachers, nurses, and administrators across 138 school districts will venture back into Alabama's classrooms for the first time since COVID-19 stopped our education system in its tracks. In the four months since schools closed in March, the Alabama State Department of Education has not developed a single uniform parameter to protect the health of Alabama's teachers and students this fall. Not one. On Thursday, I learned they don't intend to. The DOE released a so-called roadmap to reopening schools. It's a 45-page document that has no provisions for testing or contact tracing, no criteria for determining the best time for school districts to open, no statewide plan for distance learning in the event that schools are forced to close again, no substantive, uh, substantive direction. The document is nothing more than a series of colorful graphics and suggestions void of leadership required by this crisis. Now, here's the thing. There are some things that are of merit here, and we're actually going to get to those in just a second. There are some things in here that I think are at least worthy of being considered. They're not, you know, some kind of far-left ridiculous idea. But he kind of shows his hand here before he even gets into the meat and potatoes of his argument in that really there is a seething disdain by Democrats. 
this is true at the national level, and it's true of Democrats here in the state of Alabama. They hate local control. Can't stand it. They want everything to be mandated by the largest level of government as possible. That's the reason that the left really loves organizations like the UN and the EU, because they want basically a world government. They love big government, and because of that, they can't stand the fact that a local school board or a local mayor or you know somebody over the education in that particular area of the state might be allowed to make their own decisions. I mean, you can read that right here where he's like, well, there's no statewide plan. This is just suggestions. That's what it should be. Now, granted, I haven't gone through this document. I don't know. Maybe the suggestions aren't good, but he's not even criticizing the suggestions themselves. He's bothered by the fact that it's not heavy-handed, that it's not authoritarian, and they're not mandating that Alabama schools abide by these things. These are just suggestions. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. Let people at the local level make these decisions themselves. It's one of the reasons that I don't like the fact that the state government, by the way, run by Republicans, so this is not a partisan thing for me, that they decided to just shut down the state. Early on, when Governor Ivey's approach was, well, we'll just let the local towns and municipalities decide what they want to do, I was all on board with that. Even if they wanted to shut some things down for a little bit, I thought that that made sense to leave that decision-making in their hands. May not have agreed with the decision itself, but that was the right-minded approach. And then Governor I was like, uh, yeah, screw limited government. We're just going to go ahead and shut everything down on a state level. And this is what virtually every governor did. And this is exactly what is being called for here. He just despises the fact that this actually leaves some room for people at the local level to make their own decisions based on the situation. Look, if there is some kind of gigantic outbreak in Birmingham and they decide that they do need to close schools, I think that's idiotic with this specific virus because of how insanely low the transmission rate and especially the death rate in people under the age of 18 I mean, the death rate's practically nothing. In fact, I don't know if we even had an Alabamian under the age of 18 to have died from this thing. But even the transmission rate, based on several studies that have been done recently, have shown that people under the age of 18, just as a general rule, don't transmit this thing at a very high rate. And so there's really no reason to shut down schools. But even if there were, that should be something that the local school gets to decide for themselves. If there's a gigantic outbreak in Birmingham, that is not a good reason for shutting down the schools in Huntsville and Montgomery and Mobile. If there's a big outbreak in Auburn, there is no reason to shut down the schools on the other side of the state in Tuscaloosa. That just doesn't make any sense. And so, regardless of whether the suggestion's in here or not, I don't know, I haven't read the document myself, I didn't have time to, to do that today, but... Regardless of the quality of that, the fact that he is bothered by the mere idea that local people might be able to make their own decisions based on some of the suggestions that were handed down by the state, it really is telling of his political ideology. And then he goes on later in this one, uh, but I know problems are rarely solved in anger. So I started focusing on solutions. In a time when nearly everything in our country is politicized, the wisdom that stood out to me the most was from the late Republican Senator John McCain. Quote, glory belongs to the act of being constant to something greater than yourself, to cause, to your principles, to the people on whom you rely and who rely on you. Yeah, this is a pretty bad attempt at creating some kind of unity here. Quoting John McCain is not going to win you friends in the Republican Party, especially, especially not now. Like, maybe it would have, I don't know, a decade ago, but especially with the way that John McCain has been viewed recently, uh, before his, of course, unfortunate passing. Quoting John McCain is just not a way to win yourself into the mind or to gain some kind of credibility that you're not some kind of rabid partisan when it comes to a Republican, because John McCain is viewed as a rabid partisan. <laughs> and so it's a, a very strange way, like qu quoting a Ted Cruz or a Mike Lee or a Rand Paul or, or even a more moderate Republican of today 
uh, maybe your Matt Gates, um, somebody along those lines, that's going to go a lot longer in, in helping you with that than what you're talking about here. So very, very strange tactic trying to quote John McCain to ingratiate Republicans to you. That just doesn't work anymore. And so he continues on. With all the fear, uncertainty, and loss COVID-19 has caused, we now have the opportunity to change the landscape of public education in Alabama for now and the future. This is about a cause greater than any single individual. Okay, now he shows his hand. We've been kind of building up to this the entire article. Now he absolutely bleeds his hand. His intentions are made manifest. And I don't know if he intended to do that or not, but he's just shown exactly what he wants to do. L listen to the language here. We have an opportunity to change the landscape. And he is saying that that is available because of all the fear, uncertainty, and loss that has happened since COVID-19. This reeks of Marxism. I'm not saying the suggestions that he's about to put forth are Marxism, but I'm saying you can tell this is Marxist ideology. What we will do is, just like a progressive always does, we will wait until there is an opportunity where there is great fear and great uncertainty and use it as a method to insert the kind of government that we want. I mean, this, is the, this goes all the way back to the Fabian Society. And I don't know if he's intentionally using that playbook or not, but this is the way Democrats think. We'll wait until there is some kind of big crisis like former Chicago mayor and, and chief of staff for Obama, Rahm Emanuel said, never let a good crisis go to waste. That we're going to wait until there is some kind of great giant uncertainty, and then the second that that happens, we're going to utilize that as a means to justify putting the policies that we've always wanted into place. And this is exactly what he's about to do here, is that something that he's wanted that has nothing to do with the coronavirus that has always been that. And I love how the leftist solution to everything is, oh, if you just implemented the policies that we've always been talking about and always wanted, you saw AOC doing this with the universal basic income when we started sending out st stimulus checks. Uh, they did it with Obamacare. They, they've they done it uh, recently here in Alabama trying to suggest that the coronavirus means we need to expand Medicaid. It's amazing how the solution to every crisis that arises is the thing that Democrats have been wanting to do for decades. That's always their solution to every problem. Uh, it's weird how every crisis seems to line up with that. And so he goes on and talks about uh, this a little bit later. The Alabama School Nurses Association's proposed Safely Opening Schools program. It's an aggressive, proactive plan focused on health equity, ensuring that each and every Alabama school is equipped to implement health measures to keep our teachers and students safe. It includes three primary components. So I have to butt in here just a second. First of all, again, this is amazing how the, the union for school nurses in the state of Alabama support a plan that would mean that there are a lot more nurses in the state of Alabama and they get paid more money. Wow, amazing how that happened. I mean, that would be like the road construction union being in favor of a bill that would require the state of Alabama to build a lot more roads. Again, that doesn't mean necessarily that the plan is bad. It just means that he's using this as some kind of credential suggesting that, oh, well, you see, the Association of School Nurses supports this plan. Well, yeah, they're going to get a lot more money from it. If I told uh, an employee, is like, so um, would you support a new policy where we pay you a lot more money and give you more hours? And they go, yeah, well, that should come as no surprise. <laughs> you can't really use that as a credential in this. But he goes on and he says, building nurse stations slash isolation rooms in every single school in Alabama at a cost just under 50000 per building. All right, so this is important to note. Alabama has 795 nurses and 1,659 schools, meaning that if every single current nurse had a station and an isolation room, that would come up to, and, and this is assuming that every single school that has a nurse has a nurse's station, which they don't. But even ignoring the fact that they, they don't have that, even if you just count the ones, the schools in Alabama that currently don't have nurses, that would still mean that that would come up to a price tag of at least $43.2 million. And again, that's the lowball figure. And then he also says, purchasing testing machines and supplies for every school in Alabama that is projected to result in more than 500,000 tests in nine months. Okay, 864 schools currently have no nurse, which means 
that the median income of the salary for the school nurse in the state of Alabama, which is roughly 47000 that would mean that even if you ignore just promoting part-time nurses, which there's a lot of in Alabama, even if you ignore the cost of that promoting them to full-time, that means that that price tag is going to come out at just over $40 million, at about $40.6 million. And so, overall, that's $80 million right off the bat. Now, is that unreasonable? I don't know that it necessarily is, but this is not necessarily a, a super affordable plan. It's pretty sweeping, but again, this having very little to do with the coronavirus and something that they've been wanting to do for a long time now, they're suggesting that we'll just utilize coronavirus to shoehorn this policy in and keep it there forever. Same thing with Medicaid. You see, if this were something that could be done only for a year or something and try it out and see what the benefits were or just as an emergency thing just to be done for the virus, might be a little bit more palatable, a little more feasible, but they're saying, no, no, let's utilize this crisis as a way to permanently change the landscape. This isn't me editorializing. He says that's his intended purpose in the article. Democrats always take every single possible opportunity to expand government at every single turn they can whenever there's a crisis. And it seems to always be policies that they intended to push through before the crisis even started. They just use that as a way to, to slam it in when people are scared and uncertain. I mean, this is Democrat Mantra 101. Again, as far as the merits of the policy itself, that's a discussion for another day. But what I really want to highlight is even the quote-unquote blue dog Democrats, the more conservative Democrats here in Alabama, they're all operating from the same playbook. They all have the same mindset that the goal is to grow government and grow government and grow government. Now you messed it up. <laughs> You're stupid. <laughs> Now, today's Daily Dose of Stupid is really special because it's just one Daily Dose of Stupid segment, but there's two sources of the stupid going on. And normally when we have two sources of stupid, it's one of the things where we have two sides fighting with one, in, one another and both sides happen to be wrong. That is not the case for this one. We've got one stupid person playing off of the other one, and one says something dumb, and someone and, and the other one tries to agree with them, and in turn says something even more stupid, and it just kind of goes in this downward spiral. This happened in a segment that has been going on on CNN for quite some time now. It's the segue between Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon show, where the two of them kind of play off of one each other, uh, one another, and just try to out liberal one another. And in turn, of course, they wind up saying very stupid, ridiculous things. But this particular night, there was a veritable cornucopia of stupid to go around. So we'll go ahead and play that first clip. And remember, when you're watching this, that the subject matter, the reason that they are on this talking point is they are discussing tearing down statues of the Founding Fathers and, and people that have done so in recent weeks. Mind you, not Confederate generals, even though it was wrong to do that as well. Now they're talking about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, men like this. And, and this is where that clip goes. So if someone says, oh, this is going to go way too far. Well, how far is this going to go? Just say, no, we're not. That's not what we're doing here. What we're trying to do is learn about each other. We're trying to put history in the right context. We're trying to, um, to get you to understand that a lot of what you've been taught in history has been propaganda. And some things you need to unlearn so that you can become a better citizen and that the promise of what America is is available to all. Why not have the mindset of, well, maybe we should be taking down some of these statues. Yeah, engage and the fear. Exactly. Engage the fear. But people because are afraid where does to that change. come from? Where does it end? Yeah. But, but that, that's not coming from a place of logic. Uh, nobody's saying, well, then it never ends. Y yeah, it does end, first of all, because what you're dealing with is a time in history where slavery was OK. So you can see there that the level of stupid just gets cranked up to 11. And the reason that that is the case is because they are playing off one another. The stupidity only increases the further on in the clip 
that they go because they're trying so hard to agree with the stupid thing that the other guy just said, and that's how they wind up in this place where they're talking about tearing down statues of, of guys like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson somehow seems reasonable to them. And because that's their stance, they continue to say things that are continuously even more and more idiotic. What's funny about all this, though, especially with the two of them basically trying to make the point, oh, that they're, the people that are opposing us on this, they're trying to say that this could go too far, and, and where does it end? And, and Chris Cuomo going, well, yeah, it does end. See, here's the funny thing about Chris Cuomo saying that. This is round three. Because you may recall that several years ago when we were having this debate on the national stage, that it was about the flag. It was about the state of South Carolina. This happened back in 2015. But the state of South Carolina flying the Confederate flag over at state capitol, which I agreed, not a good idea, especially if you know the history and how that came about and how it was actually started specifically to be an intimidation factor to black people. It was done in the civil rights movement basically to voice South Carolina's disdain for it at the time, and, and they're not the only ones that did it. Other states did it too. Uh, but anyway, if you understand that and you remember that they said exactly the same thing when we were talking about bringing the flag down, they're like, oh, all these conservatives, all these people on the right are saying, when is this going to end? Well, this is where it's going to end. And then, of course, what, like, I don't know, a week later, people were having discussions about tearing down statues of Confederate generals. And, and that is something that kind of continued on for a while. And Fast forward to today, now there are people in the Democrat Party, this is becoming an increasingly mainstream Democrat idea to not just tear down the Confederate generals and people that fought for the Confederacy, whether they were pro-slavery or not, but now also taking it to tearing down Washington and Lincoln. And so here's Chris Cuomo ironically saying, all these people are saying, well, this never stops. Yeah, we're, we're on round three of that. Like, if you remember anything past 15 seconds in the past, you know that that argument holds weight because thus far it's continued to go. And what's also funny is that the definition of progressivism is that it's continuous. It continues to go on. They continue on with this line of thinking and it never ends. That's one of the precepts of, you can go all the way back to, to Heigl, uh, in Germany, like th this goes back even before Marx, when you're talking about the ideas of progressivism that, that humanity constantly goes down this trail. And so it's hilarious that Chris Cuomo is saying, well, of course this ends. Well, no, not if you're a progressive. The whole mantra of progressivism is to constantly progress and continue onward. Now, if you have a biblical worldview, you understand that mankind doesn't always progress. We can progress, we can regress. This is something that happens in waves. We can go up and down, and that's because we believe in an objective truth. Ergo, you can get closer to the truth or further away from the truth, but there is not some kind of constant, continuous, guaranteed improvement over a long period of time. And so it's hilarious that he's the one saying that that's the problem. I'm old enough to remember when John Oliver was saying exactly the same thing back in 2015 and 2016 and saying, oh, all these people that are saying that this is a slippery slope, they're just crazy and they're paranoid. We're never going to be tearing down statues of Washington. I remember back when Donald Trump, this was back during Donald Trump's presidency. So uh, I think this would have back, been back in uh, 2017 because it would have been not long after he was elected where they were making these same arguments right around the time we had the, the white nationalist rally with the alt-right and, and he said, and was mocked for it in the media, that when they're talking about these Confederate statues, the next thing you know, they're going to be talking about tearing down Washington and Jefferson, and here we are. And so Chris Cuomo defeats his own argument, yes, it doesn't stop. It, it continues on, and their side is the one doing this. Uh, one thing they said that was ironically correct, but in the wrong way, was Don Lemon says, we well, have to remember that most of the things that you've been taught in history, those things are propaganda. Okay, I, I want you to hear what you're saying, Don Lemon. The left has had control of the education system in America predominantly for about 100 years now. 
I mean, you can trace that all the way back to Woodrow Wilson. The colleges, especially, but K through 12, has always leaned on the liberal side. They've continued to have the institution of academia for about a century now. I agree with Don Lemon that a lot of the things that you're learning in history are indeed propaganda, but propaganda promulgated from the left, given with a leftist stance on history, not the right. I mean, I have literally libraries full of books that talk about how we have completely demonized the founders, uh, the, the popular historian thing for, and this is back in my childhood, back in the 90s, where everybody was talking about how the founding fathers were really all deist, and there was a constant smear campaign against people like Jefferson, like Adams, like Benjamin Franklin. And this is something that has been constant. And so this idea that bashing the founders is a new idea and that history that has been given to school children is propaganda from the right and it actually made the founders sound better than they have. Have you not been in a classroom in the past 30 years? The vast overwhelming majority of history that is taught in our school system today is anti the founders. It actually goes out of its way to paint them in a negative light that they do not deserve. And so... He accidentally finds a bone there, but in the opposite way of the way that he meant. And now there's like two or three more minutes of this whole thing going on. And I spared you that. See, th this is why I have the job that I do. I'm willing to watch all of this and then parse down the rest of it so it's easier to consume. But he goes into a long diatribe where basically he parrots almost verbatim the talking points of the 1619 Project, this massive pseudo-history that even historians from the right and the left have looked at and said that there's no truth to, that it's basically historical fiction rather than an actual work of academic historic research. They, they don't footnote anything. They don't give any sources for anything. They basically just make up a narrative as they go along that has no basis in truth or in history itself. And finally just to sort of put a cherry on top of all of this, Chris Cuomo is saying, well, basically, they're just all afraid of change. And, and the reason that they don't want to accept this is because they're afraid of change. Well, I am afraid of change when we're talking about an academic endeavor and the changes to something that would not be true. That change I am afraid of. I, I'm horribly afraid of that change because it's incorrect. In the same way that I would be afraid of people changing the scripture to say something that it didn't originally say. Same thing with history. Of course, the Bible is also history, but that's the example that I'm giving here. Uh, if you were to change math to say that 2 plus 2 is 5, I would be afraid of that change, which, by the way, they actually kind of did in Common Core, which is yet another example of how the left controls education in this country. But if they were to change that, I would be afraid of that change too, because it is changing from something that is correct to something that is incorrect. This goes back to worldview again. If you're a progressive, you believe that change can't possibly be bad because you believe that mankind goes in a constant upward arc, that there is always a trajectory that mankind is constantly improving that is impossible for us to regress, and we constantly just continue in that upward arc. If you believe in an objective truth, you believe that change can be good and can be bad. It depends on the change. I'm not afraid of change at all. When we're talking about something that is positive, if you want to take out all of the garbage that is taught in our history classes today that has no basis in history, or if it does have any academic basic, it's usually about a group of five or six historians quoting one another, despite the fact that they don't have any original sources to back up that stance. You talk about taking that out of the classrooms, taking that propaganda out. Yeah, I'm all for that. That's good change. See, I am only afraid of change when it moves from something that is true to something that is untrue. Otherwise, the change doesn't affect me. But unfortunately, this is actually the least stupid thing or not the least stupid thing, but the second stupidest thing that was said in this monologue, here's the first. But here's the thing. 
Jesus Christ, if you believe in, if you, if that's who you believe in, Jesus Christ, admittedly was not perfect when he was here on this earth. So why are we deifying the founders of this country? Okay. <laughs> Don Lemon. First of all, the perfection of Jesus Christ is literally one of the most basic tenets of Christianity. Literally, the whole system doesn't work if Jesus wasn't perfect. None of it. I don't think I have to explain this to the average person because I would like to believe that the average person is actually in, more intelligent than Don Lemon and knows that if you do not have a perfect Christ, a perfect sacrifice to be offered up on the cross and have his perfect sinless blood shed for mankind, there is no salvation. Literally, the whole religion doesn't work if you don't believe in the perfection of Christ. Now, there are a lot of different stances that a lot of people ta take through all different denominations, even seeing aspects of Jesus' life differently. There have been literal sects of Christians that fought, I mean literal violence and fought, over disagreements within the religious orthodoxy of what they believed was correct. You know what nobody, no Christian has ever fought over? Whether or not Jesus Christ was perfect. Literally not one. I mean, maybe you could find some crazed, random, quote-unquote Christian that isn't actually a Christian, but believes that, but you're never going to find, I mean, whether you're talking about Catholic, Baptist, uh, Church of Christ, Methodist, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who you talk to, what denomination they are, if they're a Christian, is Jesus Christ perfect? Yep. Th that is universal. And so... I think it's funny that he also uses the word admittedly there. I'm like, who, who's admitting that? <laughs> who are you talking to, Don Lemon? <laughs> it's also important to note that Don Lemon, who doesn't really, he's not religious anymore. He was raised Baptist and he went to a Catholic school. Did he just sleep through his entire religious education? Did he sleep through every single church service? Because if you really were, as he claims to be, and I have no reason to believe that he's lying about this, was raised as a Baptist and went to a Catholic school that at some point they might have covered this? I mean, that's about as basic to Christianity as any other concept. L literally, the entire religion doesn't work, if that is not the case. Every, even somewhat mainstream line of Christianity believes this. And really what it, it does boil down to is not only is this wrong, because of course it's wrong, and I, I, could, I could provide a laundry list of verses <laughs> that point to this, because like I said, it's, it's one of the very basic, most fundamental tenets of Christianity. It's, it's stated hundreds, dozens, if not hundreds of times in the Scripture, especially in the book of Hebrews. But... Even if that, even though, of course, it is wrong, what it does show is a blatant ignorance of Christianity. And the reason that he believes this is because it is the logical conclusion of postmodernism. If you believe that Jesus wasn't really the Messiah, he wasn't really God, uh, then that's the case. But he's not even right along those lines because he prefaces his statement by saying, if you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus, then you believe he wasn't perfect. No, literally everybody that believes in Jesus believes he was perfect. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't believe he's the savior of mankind, then he's not perfect. I mean, you cannot sync those two. To, to kind of illustrate this really quickly, because this is a, a very, very common trope within postmodernist thought. They, they try to invent the postmodern Jesus who wasn't really God and never really claimed to be and was kind of, they, his apostles came along afterward and embellished a lot and made him into a God when he really wasn't. But again, the people that believe in Jesus don't believe in that. But even that doesn't make any sense. It comes from this postmodernist idea that you can have your cake and eat it too, that you can acknowledge Jesus as some kind of really good moral teacher and, you know, along the same lines of Buddha and, and maybe some other Greek philosophers, your Aristotles and your Socrates, so a, a good moral teacher, but, but not God and not deity and not somebody that ever claimed to be. To illustrate this point, I'm going to go to somebody 
that is even better versed in this stuff and, and can speak even better than I can, C.S. Lewis. And so if you'll look at this quote from Mere Christianity, Lewis says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, talking about Jesus here, of course. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the things that this said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Um, I think nowadays you actually can identify as a poached egg. So Lewis's <laughs> writings here from the 1950s a little out of date. Uh, now the left would accept even that. Uh, but he goes on to say. You must make your choices either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit him out and kill him as a demon, or you can fall to his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option, he has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And again, this is something that goes back to the fundamentals of Christianity. Either Jesus is God, or he's a terrible person that has led millions of people astray and have had people put his faith in him despite being a false prophet and a liar or a crazy person. There is no halfway point with Jesus. And like Lewis just alluded to, Jesus wanted it that way. He wanted you to not be able to say, oh, well, you know, he was a great moral teacher, but he wasn't really God. Well, then he's a huge liar, probably the biggest one in all of human history. And you couldn't say that that person was a moral teacher. And, and Lewis points it very succinctly that you, you really only have two options with Jesus. And so Don Lemon is one of those people that tries to have his cake and eat it too, that, that doesn't want to go out and full-on bash Jesus, but you know also doesn't want to admit that he's God or anything. And so he arrives at this halfway point, and that's how you can arrive at saying something so blatantly stupid and contradictory to Jesus' own teachings as to say that, well, Jesus, it's not like Jesus was perfect. That's the only way a person can arrive at that if they are marred neck deep in this postmodernist thought. And so the, the thing about this is, though, even if he were right, even if Don Lemon's analogy worked there, even if Jesus was not perfect, as absurd as that would be, even then his analogy doesn't work. Because there is no rule that says that we could only put perfect people on pedestals and, and put them as statues. Now, I don't agree with deifying the Founding Fathers either. I can name, because I am a student of history and because I have studied the Founders so much, I can name a vice or a problem that I have with literally any Founding Father. Some are more minor than others, but I can point out flaws. I, I don't think that they were perfect men. But what's so funny is, we've had several billion people walk this earth. We have seven billion now. We've had at least a few billion more if you count up all the people of all of human history. And Don Lemon picked literally the only human being in all of human history that that analogy does not work for. <laughs> I mean, those are astronomical odds that he would pick the only person out of the entirety of the human race from beginning to end that that analogy falls short on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the point doesn't make sense. Because if the rule is we're not allowed to have statues of imperfect people, then we have to tear down literally every statue that isn't of Jesus. We have to tear down every statue of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and... Uh, Every, not just Washington, I'm sure there's statues of Barack Obama that we'll have to tear down now. Like, literally every statue of a human being that isn't Jesus Christ has to come down if that is Don Lemon's standard. Erecting a statue to somebody is not deifying them. It is an honor, it is a tribute, and we tend to honor and tribute them with the things that we admire about them. I've given this an analogy on the show before. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Great civil rights leader, did a lot of really fantastic things, a lot of history 
would suggest that he was a notorious adulterer that with multiple times he slept with women that were, was not his wife. That's a horrible thing, but we don't have a holiday for him and we don't have statues and roads named after him because we're honoring adultery. We're doing so because we are honoring what he did to the country, which by the way is of course worthy of honor. Erecting a statue or a memorial to somebody does not mean that you are honoring all of the worst parts of them and their vices. You are honoring something that is worthy of honor. And understanding that, with the exception of Jesus Christ, that nobody is perfect, that's the way we ought to look at monuments in the first place. But what this all really comes to a head with, they're all so baffled, and this is what I do find hilarious about it, that they are all so baffled and confused why we can't take them seriously on issues. Like, Don Lemon and other people at CNN are just shocked and appalled, and they talk about this on their show. They're just surprised that nobody on the right listens to them or takes them seriously. When you don't even understand the absolute bare-boned basics of how a Christian views the world, how can you expect them to take them seriously? And I love how this whole segment, and, and they keep going back to this, like, well, this is really all about understanding. You don't even understand that the Christian believes that Jesus is the perfect Savior of mankind. You can't condescendingly just preach down to somebody having a lack of understanding when you don't even get to that level. And so, ultimately, they have no interest in understanding. They put that on display over and over again. You can see it plainly here that they have no interest in understanding you, and that's the reason that the vast majority of people on the right that, you know, don't do news commentary for a living like I do, have no interest in understanding their point of view either. That kind of ignorance with a lack of curiosity is part of the reason it's hard to build a bridge between somebody that has a Christian worldview and a non-Christian worldview. It's almost like they're not even talking the same language. Don Lemon is so woefully ignorant of how Christians see the world that it's almost impossible for him to come up with something that's even somewhat coherent and relatable to them. And that's the problem. Let's go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps under the command of General George Washington each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. So our Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series in 1 Samuel. And just to understand where they are in the story here, God has commanded Saul through the prophets to go and slay the Amalekites. So this is the charge that he's given, and he's told specifically, you, you have to destroy every aspect of their society. You destroy their, their king, you destroy all of their people, men, women, children, livestock, and of course, you know, to, to our modern ears, that sounds awful and horrible, they were engaging in some of these awful, horrible sins, and, and this is something that is a, cor a command given directly by God to the Israelites. It's, it's not as though the Israelites came up with this on their own. This is the commandment that God sends down to King Saul. And so that's what Saul was told to do. It's not what Saul did. See, what Saul did was he went into the Amalekites and the country that they were living in, and he brought back their king. So instead of destroying all of them like God told him to, he decided to bring back King Agag and do so as, as basically a trophy or a hostage or however you want to paint that. And he also didn't stop there. He also brought back all of the best livestock and brought them back too, even though he was supposed to destroy them as well. So that's the setting that we find ourselves in here in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 10 through 11. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel and said, Sa Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have not made Saul king, for he 
has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commandments. And Saul was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. A couple things that kind of jump out when you read this verse. First of all, the language that is used here, it acknowledges Saul's change. So instead of just giving commentary on what's going on specifically in the here and now, which of course is the primary focus of this verse, there is also several hints throughout this short passage of Scripture that God is not only focusing on Saul and what he is doing right now, that God is aware of and acknowledges that this is a change for Saul. Saul has not always been perfect. Saul has made several big mistakes that we've already seen in the scriptures here, but he's also done several really good things, things that are praiseworthy, things that God, things that God has been very pleased with Saul and his behavior in. And so that's not something that can be easily dismissed or ignored, and God doesn't do that. Just like any parent that has a child that is disobedient, God sees Saul and is sorry and upset that he's acting this way not only because it's a bad thing for him to act this way now, but also because God sees what he could have been and how Saul has been and has behaved in the past when he was more loyal to God. And so the, the language that's used here where it says, first of all, regret is a part of it, but he goes, he is turned back from following me. You know, well, turned back, you know, would indicate that he was following him at one time, and so this is really God kind of crying out and sad that Saul has chosen to behave the way that he has. And the lesson that I think that that says to us is we're not incapable of turning on God. We'd all like to think that we are. We would all really love to believe that once we become a Christian, once we are on God's side, that, that that's it, we're done, and, and we can just kind of cruise until the end. But that's not what Christianity looks like, and that's not the kind of Christianity that Christ talks about in the Gospels. He talks about it being a struggle and a fight. In fact, if you look at what God is saying and, and look at what Jesus says about following him, you could easily surmise correctly that it is going to be the hardest thing you've ever had to do. And he knew that. And so we can turn our backs on God. We can be in his good favor and then stop acting the way that we're supposed to. That's something that Jesus acknowledges. That's something that is acknowledged by the scripture here, that Saul at one time had God's favor, and that was because he was doing the things that God knew that he was supposed to do, and God commanded him to do those things. And then, as time went on, Saul got a little less concerned with doing what God wanted him to do, and he started letting some things slide, and he would do some things that uh, we're technically in the right, but maybe motivated by the wrong thing. And, and then he moves into right here where he's just openly defying a direct order that God gave him. And he's trying to be sneaky about it and doesn't necessarily want to broadcast that he's doing that, but he's still willing to do it is the point. And that's what's so incredibly sad here. You see, we can't rest on having been good before. We can't just lay back and rest on our laurels and, and look at great things that we've accomplished in the past and say, look at all these things I've done for the kingdom. Well, first of all, get over yourself. The scripture says that even our great deeds are as filthy rags to God. I mean, we're just workmen. We're just doing the things that we're supposed to do. We're not necessarily doing anything astounding or worthy of some kind of great commendation when we're doing just the things that we're supposed to do the things that God commanded us, that's, that we're fulfilling our purpose. We're not doing anything extraordinary. And this is something that maybe that was part of the reason that Saul thought he could get away with some things. Because he not only got accustomed to getting his way as king, 
But he also maybe thought to himself, well, look at all the good things that I've done for Israel. I've helped deliver us from the Philistines. I, he put your, I think maybe he put himself in that mindset to where he was really thinking about it more from the standpoint of, well, I, I've done all these things, so surely I can sort of look at these, you know, these commands as, as more like guidelines and suggestions, and I can do a little bit more of what I want, and that's just not the way that God operates. And we'll see that later on in the story, it winds up biting Saul pretty badly. But I think it's also important to note here that the indication from the Scripture is also that God and Samuel both are very sad about this. If you look at the way that it ends there, it says that I regret God talking there, that he had made Saul king. Now, it's important to note that God's regret and our regret, two completely different things. When we say we regret something, basically the sentiment we're conveying to other people is, boy, if I wish I had a time machine and I could go back and correct my mistake, yeah, I would. Not what's going on here. What God is essentially saying is he's sorrowful and in fact, if you look at the Hebrew language in the writing that is given here, uh, th there's quite a bit of indication of that as well. Basically, that God is uh, experiencing sadness because of Saul being made king. Now, God actually could go back in time and correct his mistake if he really wanted to, and obviously he doesn't, which means that this was part of his plan. This was something that he knew that was going to happen even as he was making Saul king. But what it is trying to convey is that God has a very deep sadness for the way that Saul is behaving. And it says later on in the scripture that Samuel is distressed too, so much that he cried out to God all night long. You know, you look at that. God and Samuel didn't hate Saul. They didn't want him to fail. They weren't sort of the character caricature cartoonish version of God that atheists like to pretend is going on here to where God is just kind of sitting there waiting to constantly thump people he doesn't like. That's not the indication we're given here at all. God is like a grieving parent that is looking at his child, openly defying him, doing things that he knows are bad for him, and, and seeing that it's something that he, he just wishes that Saul were better. And we're doing the things that he did when Saul was younger and had more of a heart for God. And Samuel's the same way. Yes, Samuel's not God. Samuel's not really the parent figure here, but Samuel is a fellow follower of God. And he's the person that anointed King Saul, and he's really sad to see Saul that had so much promise and so much potential and did many wonderful things for the Lord has now turned into this. And that's the same kind of attitude that God has towards us when we turn away from Him. Especially in the books of poetry, you look back and you, you see the sort of imagery there of a parent walking with their young child at that, that time when they're little bitty where they admire their parents and respect them and try to obey them. And then time goes on and they lose that reverence and they lose that passion and they lose that kind of childlike trust in God and start going off and doing their own thing which leads to destruction. That's the kind of sentiment that is trying to be reflect here, reflected here, but I think that the sobering lesson that it gives to us is that God does, of course, help us out. He tries to help us and work His providence into our lives to where He can help save us from our mistakes for a little while, but eventually, no more. Eventually, He is going to let us fall prey to the consequences of our own actions. And most of the rest of the book of 1 Samuel is God allowing that very thing to happen to Saul. He is allowing Saul to reap that which he has sown. He protected Saul for a very long time. He blessed Saul, and even when Saul made mistakes, God tried to help him out. But when you get into the realm of open rebellion against something that God told you to do, that's at the point where God's going to let you face the consequences of your own actions. And if we want to avoid that, then we need to have that childlike trust in God that Saul had when he was a new king and, and when this relationship between him and God first started and he really had a heart for pleasing God and doing what he said. 
And if we can have that, then, then we'll have the same kind of good relationship with God that Saul had at the very beginning. That's a lifelong goal that we should be striving for. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media or our business partners. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Video production by Jackson Dean. Broadcast studio provided by Faulkner University. Location studio provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2020.